So tonight with us we have John Birch. He is the Vice President of Appellate Advocacy for Alliance Defending Freedom, the world's largest legal organization committing to protecting religious liberty, free speech, marriage and family, parental rights, and the sanctity of life. John has argued 12 cases in the United States Supreme Court and three dozen times in state Supreme Courts across the country. The matters he litigates frequently involve the most pressing of social issues of the day, including a state's right to define marriage in Obergefell v. Hodges, and a state's ability to protect innocent unborn life in Dobbs v. Jackson's Women's Health Organization. Please give a very warm welcome to John Birch. Thank you for that warm Notre Dame welcome. I am delighted to be here. Um, I've got two sons who have attended Notre Dame, uh, an older son, Michael, who graduated from the architecture school last year, and uh, Evan, who just did that really kind introduction. And what I most love about the campus is the enthusiasm among the students for embracing and living out their Catholic faith. Um, and I, I see that especially in the Students for Life Club, also in SCOP, uh, some of the other great groups that you have here on campus. And so I, I really appreciate your um, enthusiasm and attention for something as important as Humana Vitae and Theology of the Body and the Church's teaching on human sexuality. Um, so, so two kind of introductory points before I dive deep into those. Um, and, and first is to kind of address an elephant in the room. Um, I'm not a theology professor or even a trained theologian. I'm a lawyer. And, and I'm not even a law professor like you're going to hear from uh, Professor Sharif Gurgis. Uh, is that tomorrow? Maybe next month? next month. All right, so you got another event with him. You know, law professors can talk about anything. You just put it in front of them, and um, he's going to be fantastic. But I'm a practicing lawyer, so I go to court and I deal with constitutional issues like same-sex marriage, like gender ideology, like the right to life, and, and things like that. Uh, you know, so really my only qualifications to be talking about the church's teachings on marriage and human sexuality are the fact that I'm Catholic. I've been married for 28 years. Um, I've got five kids, and I've got a passion for all these things. Um, but it's really my work that has caused me to focus on Humana Vitae and Theology of the Body in a very specific way. Um, at Alliance Defending Freedom, we're not just about winning cases in the Supreme Court. Our mission statement is not to win cases or, or even to protect clients. Our mission statement is to keep the doors open for the spread of the gospel. And so when you think about a case like Dobbs, it's not simply to go to the U.S. Supreme Court and overturn just an egregiously wrong precedent. It was a terrible interpretation of the Constitution when the, the court issued Roe versus Wade. But it's to protect innocent unborn life. Or uh, this term at the Supreme Court, we've got a case called 303 Creative. And that's a design company located in Colorado. It's owned by Lori Smith, who's a graphic designer, website designer. And she wants to be able to design websites that celebrate God's plan for marriage between one man and one woman. But Colorado has a public accommodations law which requires her to create websites celebrating same-sex marriages if she celebrates God's plan for marriage. So we take a case like that not just to vindicate Lori, but so that she can teach culture about the beauty of marriage in the same way that the Bible and the church teach it. So that's why these issues are so important to me. Um, in addition, the courts tend to follow culture. Um, and, and just a, a brief note on Obergefell. Um, not many people realize that a same-sex marriage case was brought to the Supreme Court in the 1970s, long before Obergefell. The exact same theories of constitutional interpretation claiming that there was a constitutional right to same-sex marriage. The case came out of the state of Minnesota, and they lost there unanimously, and the U.S. Supreme Court denied review, and the order said that the petition was denied for lack of jurisdiction. And that's something that the U.S. Supreme Court doesn't usually say in denying a case and, and reviewing it. It usually just says denied. But by saying denied for lack of jurisdiction, what they were saying is that the court had no jurisdiction to decide an issue involving the definition of marriage. That was something that was reserved exclusively to the states. Everybody recognized that. And so the only reason that in 2015, five out of nine justices are able to say, we're going to hear this case and we're going to create a right to same-sex marriage that never before existed in the Constitution is because culture had changed so much. 
You know, as Catholics and as the Catholic Church, we didn't do a good enough job educating the culture why God's plan for marriage is the right plan for marriage, why it's the best possible thing for human flourishing. And so if we don't take the, the church's teachings on marriage and human sexuality out into the culture, then you end up with more Roe versus Wade. You end up with more Obergefells. You end up with more Bostocks, cases like that. Um, and, and so I'm going to begin and end tonight with a challenge to you, which is to learn more about the church's teaching in this area and be evangelizers. Talk to your fellow students, talk to your family members, and help explain why the church's teachings are not oppressive rules that we just have to follow, but that they're beautiful, that they're winsome, and that they truly are the best thing for, for human flourishing. Um, so that, that's the first introductory point that I wanted to make. Um, the, the second kind of goes to this point about the church making rules um, and about how we should be thinking about church teaching and human freedom because American culture has got the whole idea of freedom completely wrong. Uh, what we're told constantly by culture, this is media, movies, um, television shows, TikToks, you name it, um, that freedom is the power to do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. That, that's what freedom is. And that's not what freedom is at all. True freedom is, um, it requires a skill that gives someone the ability to perform certain actions with excellence. And so this is how the catechism describes it. Freedom is the power rooted in reason and will to act or not to act, to do this or that, and so to perform deliberate actions on one's own responsibility. There is no true freedom except in the service of what is good and just. The choice to disobey and do evil is an abuse of freedom and leads to slavery of sin. Or, as Lord Acton put it, liberty is not the power of doing what we like, but the right of being able to do what we ought. And so I want you to think about the church's teachings on not only marriage and sexuality, but in any area of the, the faith in our moral life, um, about basketball. Think about somebody like LeBron James. Um, he's probably the, the greatest basketball player who ever lived. Maybe you could quibble that Michael Jordan was better, but certainly you know, the, the best in our modern time period. I see heads shaking over there. But, but look, we can all agree that he's a great basketball player. Um, but what makes him great is not the freedom to do whatever he wants. He cannot dribble the ball, stop, and dribble it again. He cannot punch someone so that he can make his way to the basket. He cannot go out of bounds and then come back in again with the ball and not have any consequences for that. There are all kinds of rules that he has to follow because that's how you play the game. Um, and and what, what's kind of funny about this is the Bible actually addresses this point explicitly in Paul's second letter to Timothy. It says, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. <laughs> Uh, so, so what makes LeBron, LeBron great is that he has learned how to excel within those rules. We would never know that he was a great player unless we had rules that told us that points could only be scored in a certain way, that assists were achieved a certain way, that rebounds were obtained a certain way. And, and we can count all those figures because everybody gets points and rebounds and assists the exact same way. They're following the rules. So his freedom is in aspiring to greatness within the rules that basketball creates. So now apply this to the, the rules that the church talks about, all the moral rules that we have. And there are a lot of people outside the Catholic Church, uh, may, many people inside the Catholic Church, maybe even people here on the campus of Notre Dame, who think about the church's rules, especially the, the laws that God has given us about marriage, sexuality, and protecting human life, um, that they're simply rules that somebody made up, and we have to follow them. Kind of like when a parent says you have to, to clean your room and they don't explain to you why that is. And so we follow the rules because someone told us to, or we follow the rules because there's going to be a consequence from our parents or from the church. You have to go to confession if you break the rules. And that it's really just a test of obedience. And that's not what the church's rules are like at all. Just like the rules in basketball aren't made to punish basketball players, they're a construct to make sure that the game can be played in the best way possible. And so God gives us moral law, like the laws on marriage and human sexuality, and the virtues necessary to follow that because he loves us and he wants us to have true freedom. You know, Matthew Kelly's words, he wants us to be the best possible person that we can be, and we can only do that by following the rules that God ordained. Um, and so in that respect, the church's moral rules are very similar to the car manual uh, that, that you might have in the glove compartment or probably these days you just have on the phone or, or the internet. Um, you know, years before you got your car, there was someone who designed it to work a certain way. 
And so then they worked with people to put together the instruction book. And it tells you when to change the oil and when to change the air filter and that the tires need to be changed and, and all those kinds of things. Now, no one thinks that the person who created the car and those rules was trying to oppress us by instituting rules about how to take care of the car. And we do have the ability to choose to follow those rules or not. But if we don't follow those rules, what happens? The car starts to break down, it doesn't perform the way that the inventor intended it, and eventually it stops working altogether. And that's exactly the same way that it is with the church's rules on marriage and human sexuality. And, and we're going to talk about those in pretty explicit detail because St. Pope uh, Paul VI laid it out explicitly for us in Humana Vitae. He predicted exactly what would happen if we violated God's rules for marriage and human sexuality. So as we kind of dive into this, I want you to think about these as God's instruction book for good Catholic living. And these are the rules that we need to communicate to others so that they too can live lives like the car that will last a really long time and then ultimately make it to heaven. So let's turn to the encyclical. Uh, Humana Vitae of human life, um, it's not very long. Uh, as you can see, uh, Evan said they were giving out copies of these last night at a dinner. Um, you could probably sit down and read this in about an hour. Some encyclicals are very long, this one is not. Um, it was issued in 1968, which was a really turbulent time in our country when it came to sexual morals. We were going through the sexual revolution, there was Woodstock, and this free love idea that you could have uh, sex with whoever you wanted, whenever you wanted, was kind of becoming the cultural norm. And just like abortion with Roe versus Wade in 1973, the U.S. Supreme Court gave that sexual revolution a huge push through a ruling. Um, most of you probably haven't learned in your history books, that the United States in every single state had all kinds of restrictions on contraception. Some states prohibited it entirely for everybody. Other states, probably the majority of them, prohibited contraception for anyone who wasn't married. So if you didn't have access to contraception and you had sex, the consequence was to have a baby. And so as a result, there weren't that many people outside of marriage who were having sex prior to the sexual revolution. So the Supreme Court comes along and it says, we infer from the Bill of Rights a right to, to privacy that applies to, to people in the bedroom. And that right to privacy means that states don't have the ability to restrict who gets contraception. And so immediately all those laws go away and now you can, at least through artificial means, uh, eliminate the consequence of having sex. Babies can be born. And so you see a proliferation of sex outside of marriage and all kinds of other things. And, and this is the sexual revolution now kind of being, um, you know, starting to take off. And it was that same inferred right of privacy in the Bill of Rights that the court then uses in Roe in 1973 to create the right to abortion. So back to the church, um, you might also be surprised to know that until about 1930, Every single Christian denomination, including all the Protestant denominations, condemned the use of contraception as a sin. It wasn't just the Catholic Church. And then in 1930, um, there was a conference, the Lambeth Conference, where the Anglican Church, kind of in response to the early pressure leading up to the 1960s, announced that contraception would be allowed in some circumstances. And as soon as they allowed that crack in the dam, um, it just exploded, and it was a very short time after that, and they said that contraception was okay, morally speaking, in the Anglican Church for all reasons. And it wasn't very long after that that virtually every Protestant denomination went along with that. And so all of a sudden, it was the Catholic Church standing all alone by itself, continuing to maintain its longtime teaching that contraception was immoral and unlawful. Well, kind of like today, where we're having this synod on synods to determine what the church should be thinking today about marriage and human sexuality and, and all kinds of issues, including same-sex marriage and uh, gender ideology and, and things like that, there was a lot of pressure on the Catholic Church to change its teaching too. You know, why are you standing alone? And so what they did is they had a papal commission to study the issue. And they brought together doctors and theologians and philosophers, and they all discussed this um, outside of, of any conversation with the Pope. And that commission came to the conclusion that the Catholic Church should follow all the other denominations and as a matter of the Church's moral teaching, change so that contraception was allowed. Now fortunately, we had a prescient Pope who obviously prayed and discerned and talked with many of his internal advisors about this. 
And he sat down to figure out, well, what is the meaning of marriage and human sexuality as God communicates it to us? And reasoning from that, then, is contraception moral or immoral? And he rejected the recommendation. And as you can imagine, there was a, a pretty big outcry about that. Um, in 1965, there was a survey of Catholic women, and more than half of them were already using contraception in, in marriage. In um, 1973, the identical survey was done, and it went from half to two-thirds. So even with Humana Vitae coming out in the middle of this and the Pope going the exact opposite way of the Papal Commission, um, many Catholics just ignored him and continued on this same sexual revolution path that they had. Um, but he had some really, really sound reasons for why he came to the conclusion that he did. And, and we're going to walk through those, and it's going to kind of teach us what the church is thinking about marriage and sex at a high level. And then uh, a little while later, uh, we have St. Pope John Paul II coming in with his theology of the body and really expanding the, the teaching in Humana Vitae, and we'll explore that as well. So start with section one of the encyclical. It pronounces that the church's teachings on sex and contraception touch upon all humankind's <clears throat> life and happiness. So it's not just a matter of doing what's right, it's a matter of human happiness. Uh, but the kind of happiness that he's talking about isn't the short-term kind of happiness that we think about. You know, like that was a really good meal, it made me happy, or that was a great concert I went to, or you know, when Notre Dame beats Clemson on on Saturday and everybody rushes the field, you, know, you have happiness about that. Um, what he's talking about is the kind of happiness that only comes from following God's plan. Uh, when you see the car working because you're following what the manual instructs. So then in section two, he acknowledges that humankind has made stupendous progress in dominating and reshaping the, national world, or the natural world. And that's even more so today with you know, computers and the internet and cell phones and all that we have. Those were things that they couldn't have even imagined in 1968. You know, but simply in the way that they could have commercial airplanes, uh, the way that they had 100-story buildings made out of steel and, and concrete. Um, the way that they had invented artificial contraception so you could stop babies as a result of the sexual act. Now, these were all things that 50, 100 years prior, uh, no one could have imagined. It just was incredible human progress. Section 3 and 4 then explains that these technological advances always raise moral questions and that the church was created uniquely by Jesus Christ to answer those questions. Uh, section 7 says the questions have to be considered beyond the biological and the psychological, um, you know, which is basically the way culture looks at it. Um, physical, biological, does it feel good? Psychological, am I happy? Is this hurting anyone? I mean, that's the way we kind of think about things today. You know, that's all. But he says, no, you have to go deeper than that. Um, he says we have to look to the light of an integral vision of man and his vocation. Not only his natural and earthly, but also his supernatural and eternal vocation. So as we're thinking about the meaning of marriage and human sexuality, we have to take the real long view, and that's getting to heaven. And if we're not thinking about that end goal, then we can't think about sex and marriage the right way. So then section 8 observes that marriage is not something that just evolved as a matter of human history, evolution, historical chance, any of those things. It's actually an intentional design of God's love. Uh, and in fact, the very first recorded miracle that Jesus had, even before he started his public ministry, was of course at the wedding of Cana. Uh, just you know, putting his seal of approval on the fact that marriage was something that was incredibly important to God, and, and we're going to come back to that again. So what is that design of love? Uh, Pope Paul VI explained, by means of the reciprocal personal gift of self, the reciprocal personal gift of self, husband and wife tend towards the communion of their beings in view of mutual personal perfection to collaborate with God in the generation and education of new lives. In addition, marriage invests the dignity of a sacramental sign of grace in as much as it represents the union of Christ and of the church. Now, that's some pretty high-level theology, so let's break that down into stuff that, that we can understand. Um, first, what's a reciprocal personal gift of self? Well, that means that you're giving something to your spouse. It's everything that you have. You know, like when you hear about marriage as being 50-50, where partners have to meet halfway, that's not God's design for marriage. Marriage is a 100%, 100% gift of self. You're giving your emotional, your spiritual, your physical, even your reproductive capacity. You're giving it all and not holding anything back. Um, 
and in that way, it's a completely selfless giving to your whole spouse. If you're giving all those things, even your reproductive capacity, there's no room for selfishness there. You know, and, and selfishness and a lack of humility are the root of all sins. And, and when we get to his list of the consequences of contraception, you're going to see how that plays out. So, so we'll come back to this reciprocal gift when we talk about theology of the body. So in addition, as he explained, marriage is also for co-creating children with God. And that's a pretty amazing thing because if you've studied physics, even a, a first semester physics course here, you know that you can't create something out of nothing. At best, mankind can take matter and turn it into energy and energy into matter, but we can't create something out of nothing, except when we co-create with God to create a new life. Um, and that can only happen through the marital act. Um, we'll get back to this when we talk about theology of the body as well. John Paul II goes deeply into that. Um, finally, he says that the marriage union represents the union of Christ and the church. Now, to represent means an image or icon of something. It, it looks like something else. It's an analogy. And so we have to consider how did Christ love the church? He died for her. He gave up his life for the church. And that's exactly the way that husbands and wives are called to live in Ephesians 5.21. And you've probably heard this at many weddings. Uh, there are many people who kind of chafe at this because it starts by talking about the wife submitting to her husband. And people get all upset because that's terrible. Men and women are equal and, and wives shouldn't have to submit to their husbands. But what it's talking about is submitting in the sense that Christ submitted to his church. You know, giving everything of yourself. And then it goes on and challenges the men. You know, when the guys are all sitting back laughing, yeah, you know, my wife has to submit to me. Well, you've got a much bigger responsibility. You have to love your wife as Christ loved the church. That means you have to die for her. That means not only step in front of the bullet or step in front of the car if she's in danger, but that means you need to die to yourself to serve her needs and to love her every single day of your married life. And that's a really selfless, difficult thing to do. Um, and yet that's the type of marriage relationship that Paul VI is talking about here, the same kind of union that Christ had with the church. So those are kind of the three basic characteristics of marriage. And so then Pope Paul VI turns to this subject of responsible parenthood. And responsible parenthood is what brought us artificial contraception in the first place. Uh, if you wanted to be able to have sex but not have kids because you couldn't afford it, or you weren't old enough, or you were too busy with other things, you know, or, or whatever, um, if you didn't want a child to come into your life, then contraception was the way to stop the baby from being born. You could have all the fun and the, the unitiveness of, of sex, but not the consequences. Um, and, and he recognizes that for grave reasons, even married couples may have points in their life when they're just, it's not a good time to have kids. Uh, but in section 10, he tells us that the husband and wife are not free to proceed completely at will as if they could determine in a wholly autonomous way the honest path to follow. They must conform their activity to the creative intention of God. So how do you do that? Well, section 11 kind of lays it out there in black and white. He says, not every conjugal act is followed by a new life. God has wisely disposed natural laws and rhythms which of themselves cause a separation in the succession of births. And this is what the church calls natural family planning. And I hope that all of you are familiar with natural family planning. I won't go deeply into it, uh, but there, there's a number of different ways that you can practice it, whether through temperature or hormones or mucus. Um, all these different things will tell you when the woman's cycle is both fertile and infertile. And if you want to, as a Catholic, space babies out, don't have them immediately one after the other, um, then you abstain from having sex during the time when the wife is in her fertile cycle, and then you're free to have sex when she's not. And that's a huge sacrifice because sex is something that married couples enjoy. It brings them together. There's lots of good things about it. There's nothing wrong inherently with having sex when it's confined to a marriage. Um, but in, in following that natural family planning, instead of putting yourself in charge, I'm going to take the, the artificial contraception, whether it be a condom or the pill or you know, whatever it is that science has created. Um, instead of me putting it in charge, um, we're going to follow the natural rhythms and always be open to the possibility of new life being created. And that's the difference between the two. You know, it, it might, you might think about, you know, well, this responsible parenthood, aren't artificial contraception and natural family planning doing the same thing? 
Well, they're not. I mean, the, the end result is the same. You don't end up with a baby in, in most cases, but your openness to life, your, your giving of your full self, including your reproductive capacity, is still in place. You're not thwarting what God has designed for sex. Um, so what Paul, Pope Paul VI says it, is that every marriage act must remain open to the transmission of life. And NFP does that, and artificial contraception does not. It, it's that simple. And now this is where it really gets interesting, um, you know, especially for a celibate pope who wasn't in a marriage and wasn't having sex with anybody. Um, he delves into the meanings of the conjugal act. Uh, it's unitive and procreative. So in other words, it brings husband and wife closer together, and it can also result in babies. And so again, I want to pause here because he's giving us the very nature of sex itself. And that's an important concept for all of us to be thinking about because everything in the created world has a nature. And Father Michael Schmitz explains this really beautifully. You know, think about a chair that you're sitting on. Uh, what, what is the nature of chair? Well, it's something that you're supposed to sit on. Now, it's possible to use chairs in ways that are consistent with their, their purpose, that don't violate their nature, that don't necessarily involve sitting. So for example, I might set my textbooks on it and you know, it holds up the textbooks. Or I might put my coat on the back of it. It serves as a coat rack. But none of those violates the nature of chair. But if I were to use a chair as the jack for my car to change a tire, what would happen? The, the, the chair would explode. It would immediately be destroyed because I have violated the nature of chair. Now, it's not just things that have a nature, but human activity has a nature too. So think about something like eating. Um, like sex, eating has two purposes. One is to give us nourishment. It's what keeps us alive. It gives us calories to keep going. And two is for enjoyment. You know, if you go to Roars and you have a, a steak dinner, that's something that you really are satisfied with. You could feel good about that for a day or two even. So those are the two natures of eating, for nourishment and then also for enjoyment. And sometimes, if we're in a hurry, we have to get to class first thing in the morning, and so we're just slamming breakfast in the, the dining hall. Um, it's possible that we're getting the nourishment, but we're not getting the enjoyment, but we're not violating the nature of food. It's also possible that we could be sitting in the dorm room at 2 a.m. on a Friday or a Saturday, eating all kinds of junk food and slamming pop and things like that, and that's not very nourishing, it's just enjoyment, but again, we're not violating the nature of food. Now consider if I wanted to have the enjoyment of food, but I didn't want the nourishment. And so after I ate the big steak dinner at Roar's, I caused myself to throw up so that I would get rid of all that food. As you know, that's a very serious mental health condition. It's called bulimia. And at this point, I have violated the nature of eating. I have gone against one of its primary purposes. And when you do that, what happens? It destroys the human person. Bulimia and anorexia are terrible mental health diseases, and they can result in death. It's the, the, the perfect example of how violating the nature of a certain act can result in the opposite of human flourishing. It can result in destruction. So now I want to think about some of the consequences of sex when we violate its nature. When two people have sex outside of marriage, they're violating its unitive nature. You know, so the, the Pope's insight was that the first uh, purpose of sex was that it can bring husband and wife together in the, this unbreakable relationship. Well, if you're having a friends with benefits relationship, or, or worse, yeah, you're just casual sex with someone that you just met at a party, you're violating the unitive purpose of sex because you have no intention to be together. And so every cell in your body, all of your, your hormones and your physical reactions and what's happening in your brain are all telling you, this is someone that I want to be closely connected with. When in fact, there's not any long lasting connection there at all, that breaks human people. And how many of you have friends who have engaged in those ty types of just random sex encounters with people and, and really have unhappy lives? It destroys friendships, it destroys relationships, it leaves people broken, it makes it very difficult for them to have authentic love in actual relationships where they're trying to discern marriage. Violating that unitive aspect can do terrible things to a person, just like bulimia or even trying to use the, the chair to jack up the car to change the tire. There's another way that the, the unitive nature of sex can be broken, and that's when sex happens without consent, when there's a rape. 
when a rape is happening, there's no intent at all by the rapist to be engaging in any kind of unity with the person that they're having sex with. And, and just you know, imagine the, the great heartache, the physical pain, the disease, and, and all the other ramifications that come from that type of sin because that person is violating the nature of sex. They, they violated the unitive. Now, those bad consequences are easy to see because we've probably had friends or family members who have been raped, unfortunately. Um, we have friends, family members who have suffered from bulimia, from anorexia. Um, we, we've had friends who have engaged in casual sex and we've seen what that's done to their, their emotional state and the way they look at life. Um, so th the consequences of violating sex's unitive nature are pretty simple to understand. Um, but what about the procreation part? Because that's where contraception comes in. When two people engage in sexual activity with no possibility of creating a baby, that violates sex's procreative nature too. And here I'm not just talking about sex with contraception, I'm also talking about things like, and sorry this is on, on tape, but mutual masturbation and uh, same sex uh, sexual acts. Anything that doesn't have the ability to create a baby is violating the procreative nature of sex. And when you do that, there are consequences just like when you break the unitive nature of sex. And with amazing clarity, Pope Paul VI, all the way back in the 1960s, said exactly what those things were going to be. You know, and sometimes we, we think about, you know, Nostradamus and other people, you know, they're prophesizing the future. You know, I, I've never seen in modern times a prophecy that is as clear and accurate as what Pope Paul VI said, just deducting from natural reason and thinking about God's laws, um, comes from violating the procreative nature of sex. These are all in section 17 of Humana Vitae, and he describes them as grave consequences. So number one, conjugal infidelity. So people who are married and then they have sex outside of marriage. Prior to the sexual revolution in the 1960s and the advent of artificial contraception, that almost never happened. How often do you think marital infidelity happens today? Far too frequently. It's the end of many marriages. Second, he said, it would be a lowering of morality. And look at where our society's morals are when it comes to a whole great many issues today compared to the 1960s. Number three, loss of respect for women. Can anyone deny that our modern culture doesn't respect women? Um, he goes on to say what will happen is that men will start to consider women a mere instrument of selfish enjoyment. And that's exactly what's happened. That's why we have sexual assault. That's why we have sexual harassment and the Me Too movement. That's we have, why we have rampant use of pornography. Um, because men look at women as objects rather than as people. And that's one of the saddest consequences of the sexual revolution and the use of contraceptives, that women have lost that place that they were supposed to be in the original marriage design, co-equals with men and someone that the man was willing to, like Christ for the church, give up his life for because he wanted to love her, to will for her what was best for her. And, and you know, all you have to do is just walk around campus and you can see that we have completely lost that as a society, even on a campus that's generally religious and conservative compared to other universities or other parts of our culture. It's just absolutely devastating. He also said that there would be government imposition of contraception. And at the time that probably sounded ridiculous to people because the problem in people who used contraception's eyes was that states were prohibiting the dispensation of contraception, sometimes even to married couples. And yet, what do we have in the Affordable Care Act? A requirement that not only abortifacients, but contraceptions be included in every single health plan. And although the Supreme Court struck that down in the Hobby Lobby case, said the federal government couldn't do that, that ruling only applied to the federal government on the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And so we still have states like California, and Washington and others that are imposing those same contraceptive requirements on companies to provide it today. And sometimes they don't even exempt churches and other religious organizations. And so we're still fighting at Alliance Defending Freedom to give those churches and religious organizations the freedom to reject abortifacients and artificial contraception. Um, and then of course there's the issues of divorce and abortion, which he touches on as well. Um, abortion was not, or I'm sorry, divorce was not a very common thing 
prior to the 1960s. While the sexual revolution comes about, all of a sudden we start to think of women more as objects. We think of marriage as something that's designed to keep me happy and, and not a permanent covenant where we're each willing the good of the other. And what do we have next? We have no-fault divorce laws that are enacted in the 1970s. And those are sold as something that are good for kids and families because if kids are around parents who are fighting and upset with each other all the time, that can't, can't be good for them. Why don't we have no-fault divorce so that the kids can get away from that conflict? And study after study after study shows that, that e those children, even when they become adults, have permanent scars and wounds from their parents divorcing, even in very difficult relationships. And, and I'm sure many of you and your families have been touched by divorce in one way or another. It, it's just an absolutely tragic thing. And that was something that Pope Paul VI said would come to pass, and it did. And then, of course, abortion, helped along by Roe versus Wade. As you all know, being in Students for Life, 63 million Americans have been murdered as a result of abortion. So those are, are all of the grave consequences that he, decide, or he um, predicts are going to happen. And he's right on every single one of them. Now, conversely, he also talks about the benefits of foregoing artificial birth control. Um, he says that it favors attention for one's partner. And that's something that's absolutely true. Um, there's an absolutely amazing statistic that for married couples who practice natural family planning and they go to church and pray together, they have a 99% success rate in their marriages, a 1% divorce rate. Think about that. I mean, in a society where divorce is basically a 50-50 proposition at this point, and it would be higher except so many people are cohabitating and not getting married at all, that only 1% of Catholics who go to mass, pray, and use NFP get divorced. He also says it helps both parties to drive out selfishness, the enemy of true love. You know, and that goes right back to the, the nature of sex that we were talking about. If you're looking at sex as something that brings the two of you together, as opposed to something that's just for my personal satisfaction, that totally changes the whole mindset about, about being selfish. And when we can eliminate selfishness, that helps us to be better people. And so he also says um, that it allows us to facilitate the solution to other problems in our marriage. Because if we're not focused on getting what I want, but instead we're focused on making my marriage partner happy, it makes financial problems, parenting problems, school problems, you know, all those kinds of things much easier to deal with because you're approaching them from a very different perspective. He also says that parents who use NFP acquire the capacity of having a deeper and more efficacious influence in the education of their offspring, including the just appraisal of human values. Why is that? Well, if a married couple is able to take this important teaching from the church and all the grave consequences that come with it and just reject it, then how many other morals are they willing to walk away from and how many are they willing to teach to their kids? You know, and these are the cafeteria Catholics who say, well, you know, I like the fact that I'm going to be good to my neighbor, and I like the fact that I'm going to clothe uh, the naked and, and go to the prisons for the, those who are imprisoned. But, you know, all this stuff about abortion, you know, I want to do what's, what I want to do with my own body. You know, we're about sex and, and all these things. You know, I, I reject all that. Well, what, what kind of moral parenting does that type of a compass create? Not a very good one. Um, lastly, um, he says that if, if you forego artificial birth control, we'll have more children born within marriage, less divorce, and less abortion. You know, I think all those things are true. And we haven't talked much about children born outside of marriage, but that's also another epidemic of the sexual revolution and the contraceptive revolution. Now, one final practical point that I just want to mention about abortion in particular, because this is the Students for Life Club. Um, the, the dirty secret is that artificial contraception is not foolproof. Um, even the, the, the pill and um, you know, other things like you know, the, the medical implants and things like that have failure rates. And, and when it comes to condoms and things like that, the failure rates are much higher. So when people have been told that they can have sex without consequences, in other words, no babies, and then that turns out not to be true and they have an unexpected pregnancy, what do we expect them to do? They're gonna consider whether to get an abortion. So abortion is just another form of contraception. It's what society uses when artificial contraception fails. And so the, the whole point of the abortion industry is to pick up those pieces and make sure that sex still doesn't have consequences. And that's why we have 63 million murdered babies in our country. 
Um, so just kind of to, to wrap this up then, and again to think about it like the car manual, uh, the church's teachings on sex and contraception as they come to us through Humana Vitae are not a bunch of no's, rules that are just telling us things that we can't do. It's actually a bunch of yeses with explicit instructions about how we should follow God's plan and also the bad consequences that will happen when we depart from that plan. Um, so, you know, of course, the good news is that as soon as Paul VI issued Humana Vitae, everybody in the Catholic Church immediately accepted it and stopped contracepting, right? No, we already talked about that. In fact, um, it, it went up with two out of three married Catholic women reporting to be relying on birth control by 1973. Um, and so it was obvious that the church needed to explain its teaching better. Um, people were too selfish to understand the logic in Humana Vitae, and so it needed to be explained to a deeper level. And that's where we get theology of the body. Um, now, theology means the study of God. You all take theology classes, so you understand that. So theology of the body is the study of God in the human body. And it comes from a series of 129 weekly addresses that Pope John Paul II gave to papal audiences in Rome from September 1979 all the way through November 1984. Imagine having a four-year class on marriage, well, actually five years, on marriage and human sexuality. Um, and, and this is the exact opposite of the sexual revolution. And his thesis is pretty simple, that it's the body and only the body. You don't have to look at anything else that makes it capable, capable to see the invisible, the spiritual and divine. The body was created to transfer into visible reality of the world the mystery hidden from eternity in God and thus to be a sign of it. And so Christopher West, you might be familiar with him, he, he does a lot of writing and teaching on theology of the body. He says, somehow the body enables us to see spiritual realities, even the eternal mystery hidden in God. And that's quite a claim. Um, so I, I wanna dig into that a little bit, heading to the, the Bible and JP2's teachings, and then I would love to open it up for questions. As a Supreme Court lawyer, I'm used to talking in 30 to second, 60 second bursts and then getting interrupted with questions. So um, th this is very uncomfortable. So, so JP2, especially talking about sex, uh, JP2, he starts with Genesis, chapter one, the very beginning, and God creates the entire universe and he declares that everything is good, right? And some things, including the, the creation of Adam, he declares to be very good. But then in, in Genesis chapter two, we go from kind of this 10,000 foot view and we go to a really close view and things change. God creates Adam, he puts him in Eden, he instructs him not to eat of the tree of life, and then God sees that it is not good. So what's not good? Well, the Bible tells us that the man should be alone. And you know, at first glance, this could seem confusing because at this point, Adam was already surrounded with thousands, if not millions, of created creatures. You know, all the animals and the birds and the fish and everything else. Um, and he had mastery of all, over all of them. So he was hardly alone in that sense. But he was alone as the only bodily creature made in God's image and likeness. Um, he wasn't like a fish, a bird, or a chimpanzee. Um, and so God says he needs a suitable helper for the man. Now, in English, helper sounds kind of like a servant, you know, and so that pairs with people's misunderstandings of wives submitting to your husbands in Ephesians and makes you think that wives should just be helpers. But the actual word in the original Hebrew is azer, E-Z-E-R. And that word in the Old Testament is always used to describe someone who provides vitally important and powerful acts of support and rescue. In fact, the Old Testament uses the word azer 16 times to reference God as a helper. You know, God helping everyone live in a way that's going to get them to heaven one day. So th this isn't just a, a servant. This is a true partner that you're supposed to be with in that path to try to get to heaven. Um, and so that, that still leaves a question. What did man need rescuing from? You know, he was alone, but who says that it's intrinsically bad to be alone? I mean, we, we could be alone watching a movie, reading a book, sitting in nature, and being alone isn't necessarily bad, but God says, yes, being alone is bad, um, because he says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. God himself is not alone. He's this, ex exter or, um, th this exchange of love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And because man is created in God's image and likeness, he too is created and called to be in relationship just like the Trinity is. And the, the beauty of the Trinity's love is that it's completely selfless. 
There is no selfishness in the Trinity. Um, and, and here, when I'm speaking of love, I'm not thinking about our modern understanding of love. Again, just you know, emotional, feel-good, sappy kind of stuff that you see in Hallmark movies. I'm talking about the church's understanding of love, which is a choice always willing the good of the other person. And so God wants nothing but the best for Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Jesus wants nothing but the best for the Holy Father and the Holy Spirit, it's the same. And so without that kind of a relationship, Adam couldn't fulfill his purpose. He couldn't be in the image and likeness of God. He needed another human being. So now we know what happens next. God takes the rib out of, of Eve while she's asleep. And when um, Adam sees her, he makes a really weird exclamation. He says, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. So he doesn't talk about the emotional connection. He doesn't have to talk about the spiritual connection. He doesn't say, you know, this is the person that I can love. He immediately noticed her body. He noticed that they were the same bodily creature, unlike the birds and the chimpanzees and the fish. He recognized that they were both in God's image and likeness and that they were both called to live in relationship. But because they were both naked, he also recognized that they weren't the same, that God intentionally created them male and female, complementary. And in their nakedness, it would have been obvious that they were complementary. Um, they could immediately perce perceive God's plan for their togetherness through their bodies. Okay, so what happens next in Genesis? God creates Adam and Eve, male and female, and he gives them the very first commission to mankind, and that is be fruitful and multiply. So that's our cultural mandate as human beings. And that's why, as Genesis says, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. In other words, they're going to have sex and have babies. That's what the purpose of marriage is. Um, and it's not just a Genesis observation. It's the exact same thing that Jesus says in the Gospels and St. Paul in Ephesians. So when Adam and Eve came together, one body in sacramental marriage, they became this selfless gift to each other that Paul VI was talking about, that emotionally, spiritually, and even physically, their reproductive capacity, they were holding nothing back. And when they did that, they could co-create with God to make a brand new life. And now here's where it gets really beautiful because you can see the total picture of what it means to be made in the image of God's in God's image and likeness, um, and also how the theology of the body teaches us something about God. So you have God the Father and Jesus the Son in this eternal exchange of selfless love that is so powerful that proceeding from it is the Holy Spirit. Here on earth, we've got a husband and a wife who come together in this eternal exchange of love, wanting nothing but the best for each other, and from that relationship can proceed a child, an independent being that needs its own name, a son or a daughter. And so the family, the basic root of our society, the domestic church, is that icon or image of the Trinity itself. It explains God's nature, that relationship, in a way that nothing else on earth does. And so that's why when people say, well, there's nothing about same-sex marriage in the Bible. Well, you know, there's lots of prohibitions on homosexual acts and things like that. We could point to that. But we really need to point them to Genesis and Jesus and Paul in Ephesians talking about man and woman becoming one flesh. Because it's only between a man and a woman that you have the ability to create new life and to be that icon for the Trinity. That's the way that God designed it. Um, and what's, what's beautiful about it is having that child strengthens the marriage relationship. Um, when the, the husband and wife come together, that, that baby shares parts of both of them. So every time that they see their child, for the, the, the rest of their marriage, they can see their two-ness becoming oneness in their child. Isn't that beautiful? Like all of you, no matter how broken your, your home life might be, no matter what your situation was, you know, your, your adoption, in you and your DNA is embedded the vision of your mom and dad coming together. And that's really cool. And that's why, to the extent possible, the church wants kids to be raised by their biological mothers and fathers. That's not always possible. Sometimes, you know, there, there's all kinds of um, conditions, whether that's physical abuse or death or drugs or whatever, prison, that doesn't make that possible. You know, but, but that's the ideal, is to have that icon of the Trinity. Um, now, one last note before we leave Genesis and the theology of the body. Um, Adam and Eve were both naked, but Genesis 2.25 says that they were not ashamed. So you think about that, you know, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, and at no point did Eve go, you know, and, and try to cover up. 
Not, not yet, not until after they had the apple. And that's because prior to the fall, they didn't have any concern that the other person would use them for anything other than love. Eve understood that Adam wouldn't treat her as an object, and Adam understood that Eve wouldn't use him for any purpose other than that mutual self-giving love to will the best of the other person. It's when they ate the apple, we had original sin, and sin entered into the world that we got sinful selfishness. And that's why today, no one would want to run around campus naked because we have shame about our bodies. But that's not the way that God designed us. It was only because of original sin that we got to that place. Um, one other thing I want to mention is that marriage and procreation are not the only ways that we image God's love. Obviously, it's a beautiful thing when priests and other religious take a promise that they'll stay chaste their entire life, and instead their, their love will be the entire human family. You know, and in that way, that vow of celibacy, it's not a rejection of sexuality in any way. Um, it's embracing the meaning and purpose of sexuality, which is the eternal union of Christ and the church. So as great as marriage is, you know, as, as great as that eternal exchange of love is, the, the union between Christ and his church is better yet, better still. Um, at, at best, marriage and children is an image or icon of the Trinity. It's not the Trinity. And so when we have priests and religious, um, they're, they're taking a substantial step. They're giving up an entirely you know, important part of their human selves to dedicate themselves to the church. And that, too, um, mirrors God's love. So let's put all this together now. Um, when we violate God's instructions for how to live our lives and our bodies, we can cause pain and our harm to ourselves and to other people. And, and we touched on some of the, the grave consequences that Paul VI talked about. And so I, I want to briefly hit on those and then maybe add a couple that are really pertinent to a college crowd. Um, so obviously, sex outside of marriage between one man and one woman can have devastating consequences, physically and emotionally. It results in children being born out of wedlock, being raised by one parent without ever getting to know their father or their mother. Um, it, it means um, all kinds of broken relationships, you know, all those things that we talked about. Contraception, um, we've talked about that too. Um, so how about sexual acts that lack procreative capacity? And I want to dive a little bit deeper here onto a, a sensitive subject, pornography and masturbation. Um, and we just know from the surveys that those are huge problems for young people. And part of the reason is because culture is bombarding us with sexual images, and you're told that engaging in that kind of conduct is okay. In fact, if it feels good, why not do it, right? That's the whole freedom thing all over again. Um, but, but think about what happens when you've got someone, male or female, watching pornography and masturbating, as opposed to pursuing a marriage relationship and sex only within that marriage relationship. Instead of focusing on someone else, they're focused only on themselves. It doesn't require a man to go out and to date anybody, to woo anybody, to enter into a relationship. It's something that's only self-centered, you know, something that can happen in the dorm room or you know, at home in a bedroom. And you've got these pornographic images where women are, are completely um, turned into those sex objects that Paul VI was talking about. There's no actual relationship there. Um, this is just something for pure sexual gratification. And so pornography and masturbation together are one of the worst possible things that could happen to relationships and society. And you know, just like when you violate the nature of sex in the other ways that we've talked about, that hurts the human person's soul in other ways too. It makes it extremely difficult to have relationships. Um, there was an article just recently, and it wasn't a, a Catholic article, it was a secular article that talked about the problem in millennial marriages of lack of sexual intercourse between husbands and wives. And why is that? Because even after marriage, the man is still being selfish, watching pornography and masturbating rather than having sex with his wife, you know, which is about the saddest thing that, that you can think of. You know, so the, the whole notion of that rather than taking ourselves and putting them out there, making ourselves vulnerable and giving ourselves to someone else, instead is being churned inwards. And that's one of the saddest things about the sexual revolution and where modern culture has brought us. Um, and, and so, you know, as you think about your friends here on campus, I, I'm sure this is rampant. Um, you know, there was even a, a effort at one point to try to get the university to put pornography filters on all the internet access points on campus, and the university declined to do that. 
um, that, that's an unbelievably bad decision because you're just inviting the students to engage in something which is horribly self-destructive and destructive of their ability to find spouses here on campus. And this is the best possible place to find a spouse among all these other loving Catholic men and women. That's really depressing. Um, so I, I wanna wrap up with kind of three big takeaways and then I'm happy to take all your questions. First, if the process of the publication of Humana Vitae shows us anything, it's that sometimes the church needs turmoil and debate to reach really important decisions. Um, you know, there, there were people who were imprisoned and even executed over concepts leading up to the Nicene Creed, you know, about whether Jesus Christ really ascended bodily and, and things like that. And even today, as you look at the Synod of Synods, you know, where, where there's all this, this talk about um, same-sex marriage blessings and, and gender ideology and things like that. Yes, of course, we want to be a welcoming church to everybody, but we can't dispense with our rules. But, but sometimes the church needs those, those periods where it's engaging the culture in difficult questions in order to reaffirm its teachings and better explain it to everyone so that we Catholics in particular but the rest of the world understands the church's teachings so I don't want you to get discouraged when you see the Catholic Church having these internal debates about human sexuality because we know that the church will ultimately land in the right place and that's exactly what happened in the 1960s um, second I hope that you can all appreciate the beauty of the church's teachings again the, the instruction book that it's not a bunch of no's but it's about the things that are going to make us as individuals the best people that we can possibly be that the church's rules on human sexuality are all about human flourishing and getting us to heaven not about simply doing this because God says so or because the Pope said so the third thing is how badly the church and culture need you to help spread this message um, the, the counter messages that we're getting from culture right now are overwhelming. And all I have to do is look at some of the debates in the campus newspapers here, the Rover and the Observer, uh, to see that there are a great number of people, even on this Catholic campus, who just thoroughly reject the church's teachings on marriage, human sexuality, and abortion. And, and what's so sad about that is not just that it's sinful and it's going to result in an obstacle to them getting to heaven if they don't repent, go to confession, um, you know, certainly a lot of time in purgatory, uh, but, but that they're not even going to enjoy their life here on earth, <laughs> that they're not going to be able to have the, the type of authentic, loving relationships that God wants all of us to have. And, and so, so you have to tell your friends, you have to talk about this stuff. Um, and, and explain to them the importance of it. And you know, whether it's the theology of the body, whether it's Humana Vitae, whether it's listening to Matt Frad, or whether it's um, listening to podcasts with Father Michael Schmitz, the church is talking about this stuff, but not enough people are listening. Um, but if you don't spread the word, then, then none of your classmates are gonna hear about it. And, and what a, a tragedy for them to be engaging in activities that won't result in their flourishing. I mean, really, if what we want for all of our friends, all of our family members is for them to flourish and to get to heaven, it's our responsibility to talk about this stuff, even when it's uncomfortable, even when on camera you have to say words like masturbation and pornography. Um, th these are the types of conversations that, that we have to have. So I will wrap up my prepared remarks with that, and I'm happy to take your questions. Is everyone too embarrassed to ask a question? <laughs> yes. Okay, I actually have two questions. Um, the first one is you talked about uh, national family planning and how uh, it has the same result on some of the as a different kind of convention or it is not working uh, about design. What would you say to someone who says like national family planning is like not contraception? Yes, yeah, so, so why isn't natural family planning just considered artificial contraception? And, and it is because you're still receptive to life. Because even people who, who use natural family planning can get pregnant. But anytime that you engage in the sexual act, if, if you're doing natural family planning right, you've had that conversation with your spouse, well, you know, we could get pregnant. Are we going to be able to take care of this baby if we do? And so um, the, the fact that each 
sexual act has the capacity for life makes it morally different. In addition, there's an entire discipline to natural family planning that's totally different than artificial contraception. With artificial contraception, you can have sex whenever you want. There's no limitations. Excuse me. But with natural family planning, you're going to have that period, you know, maybe two weeks or so every month, where you're not able to engage in sexual relationship with each other at all. And that's a sacrifice. And sacrifice is good for marriages, and it's good for the human person. When we have to sacrifice something, it disciplines us so that we don't choose things that are bad for us. So just think about it in terms of, of fasting. Really, NFP is almost like the, the, the notion of fasting. Fasting, by the way, isn't just fasting from food. Fasting can be from electronic devices. It could be from football games. It could be all kinds of things. So as a church, why do we fast? Well, first, it, it joins our, our, our self-discipline to our prayer, and that makes our prayer more powerful. That's why the church always talks about prayer, fasting, and almsgiving together, um, because all those things reinforce each other. We could talk a whole nother hour just about that. But also, when we deny things that we want or that our body wants, it, it trains us so that we can make better choices in other places. The fact that I can deny myself meals during or snacking during the day on a day that I'm fasting or uh, you know meat on Fridays if I'm abstaining helps when I have other more difficult choices because I've trained my body that I'm the boss that my my body isn't going to tell me what to do you know and as college age students you know your, your bodies are saying I want to have sex all the time with as many people as as possible and we're kind of hardwired that way that's that's the human nature um, I'm so sorry Evan So by, by, by choosing not to do that, and then even choosing not to have sex with your spouse, you know, someone that you, you love and you want to give yourself to, that disciplines you so that you can make good moral choices in other areas. So, so the whole mentality of it is very different than the freedom to do whatever I want that artificial contraception gives us, uh, both from a, a moral perspective, but also just from a, a good living perspective. Hope that helps. D did you have a second question? Go for it. You also talk about how uh, one of the consequences of contraception uh, is the objectification of women uh, and how men start these kinds of topics. And just, I, I guess, something that I see culturally, though, as well, is that women want to participate in uh, those like, extramarital relationships. So, I, I guess, what is the yeah, flip side? Can you just see? Yes. There is absolutely a flip side. It's not just men who will treat women as objects, but it is women who will use men as, as their objects, too. It's a two-way street. Um, I, I think Pope Paul VI talked about it as objectifying women because that was the most immediate and obvi obvious consequence. But certainly, as time has gone on, uh, we're an equal opportunity society, and so it can be used equally the other way. And it's just as damaging. Um, and, and I'm sure for every girlfriend that you guys know who had sex with a guy and then regretted it because he had no interest in a relationship with her, he just wanted a one-night stand or maybe a series of stands, you probably know a guy who was hurt the same way. You know, maybe a, a roommate who started to have sex with a, a friend just because they thought it was fun, and then when he wanted more of a relationship, um, she walked away from that because she wasn't interested in it. She was only using him for her own personal gratification. And, and that can have devastating emotional effects on men just as it can on women. You know, and, and then not only are they hurt in the moment, but then uh, how open are they going to be to the next relationship? Because now that creates a distrust of the next girl who wants to, to have sex with them. Um, you know, so you just put all that together with, with the problems of, of the bodies telling each other, hey, you know, this is a unitive thing. This is going to be my lifelong partner when you're really lying about that. Um, you know, all of that extramarital sex just creates massive problems for men and women. It's very destructive. Yes. <laughs> That's a very hard question. Um, so the, the, the question is, how about the church's stance on in vitro fertilization? And first I would say to anyone who is created through in vitro fertilization that you are a son or daughter of God. You're not any less of a person than anybody else, and God loves you, and you're entitled to dignity and respect. The church's teaching on this ha has nothing to do with that. Um, but what the, the church recognizes is that creating children outside of the marital act also has grave consequences. And you say, well, what if you have a husband and a wife who really love each other and they really want to have their own genetic child and IVF is the only way to do that? It seems like that would be a really great thing that science would be able to allow them to have the child. 
But what are the collateral grave consequences for that? Well, first, when you do in vitro fertilization, um, except in the most rare clinics, um, they're not going to just fertilize one egg. They're going to fertilize a dozen or two dozen eggs. And so then you'll have all these people. And maybe two, three, four of them will be implanted in the mom's uterus, hoping that one of them will survive. Let's say all four of them survive. Then some moms will be pressured to choose abortion, either because it's difficult to carry four babies at one time and, and there may be health consequences to have that many, um, you know, health consequences to each other, the, the babies, um, or because they didn't want four babies. They only wanted one, and so then they abort them. Or the parents have their first child, maybe even a second child, and then you have all these embryos, you know, conception, people in the freezer. What do you do with those? Um, you know, typically they get destroyed. Well, th those are all the taking of human life too. And then you have the issues where not only can't they conceive together, but there's some problem where the mom can't carry the baby in her womb. And so they, they have a surrogate parent instead. And so now all of a sudden you've got uh, in vitro fertilization, mom and dad's egg and sperm, but it's in somebody else's body. And so now that person is carrying the baby. And there's a connection that builds between baby and the mom who's actually carrying the baby. Um, that's the voice that they hear. That's the... Um, you know, the, the smells that they smell. Um, you know, th there's an emotional connection before the baby is even born, and then you're ripping that connection apart. In addition, in vitro fertilization facilitates same-sex marriage relationships. Obviously, two men can't have a baby, two women can't have a baby, but through in vitro fertilization, they can find a sperm or an egg donor, sometimes a surrogate uterus, and then they can have a baby. And now you're not just ripping the baby away from the mom who grew them in her uterus, but you're also ripping the baby away from their biological mom or dad, not in a situation like adoption, where it was necessary because of, of, of death or, or human failings, um, but intentionally ripping them away from their biological mom or dad. Um, and so the, the church looks at all those grave consequences and says, we can't even open that door um, for the same reasons that we can't open the door to artificial contraception. And that's a really, really difficult teaching, especially for couples that love each other, want to have their own biological children, and they aren't able to. Uh, you know, but, but one of the beautiful gifts that the church gave us is adoption. Uh, the Catholic Church is responsible for adoption agencies and uh, foster care agencies. It was the institution that developed long before government did that. And there are babies who, because of death or because of, um, of, of human circumstances, aren't able to be taken care of by their mom or dad. And that's an opportunity for those couples that can't have babies on their own to be able to take a baby into their home and love it like one of their own. Um, and, and that's a, a difficult challenge, um, but you know, hopefully you can understand through those consequences why the, the church says no on that. But to, to reiterate the, the starting point, um, that doesn't diminish in any way the beauty and the value of a child who is conceived in, in a vitro, in vitro fertilization. Um, they are still made in the image and likeness of God, and, and they should not be treated any differently than anyone else. At the same time, we should discourage IVF as a culture. Does that at least help explain it? All right, good. Yes, Mr. Um, I have a technical question. So there are medications that are not completed of themselves contraceptives, but that greatly reduce rates of fertility in both men and women. Um, how does natural family planning account for these? I've heard different uh, versions of how you're supposed to go about it, whether or not it's only permissible at the time to be fertile, or whether it's not permissible. Um, I'm not familiar of any drugs that you would use to reduce fertility in connection with natural family planning. Not to reduce fertility as even themselves, but drugs that reduce fertility enough that they're considered by the church contraceptives, but that their purpose is, say, to uh, cure disease. Oh, yeah, so, so that's something different. Um, we, we have this whole set of Catholic they're called ERDs, Ethical and Religious Directives, and they apply to the Catholic medical profession. So Catholic doctors, nurses, PAs, as well as Catholic hospitals are all supposed to follow the, the ERDs. And the ERDs make very clear that we should not engage in any artificial contraception for the purpose of contracepting. And, and so not only the things that we've been talking about, but that thing includes things like vasectomies and hysterectomies. I mean, th those also violate church teaching for the exact same reason. Um, now, if you have a medical treatment, say a drug that you need for your physical health, and it has a side effect of impacting your fertility, uh, the ERDs do not prohibit that. 
if the intention is not to reduce fertility. Um, you know, in the same way that the, the church does not consider it an abortion if a medical procedure is necessary to save a mom's life. Say that she's got a, a fatal cancer and the only way to treat it is through chemotherapy and radiation. And a side effect of having the chemotherapy and radiation would be to take the life of the baby that she has. That's not considered an abortion because the intent isn't to take the life of the baby. In your situation, the intent isn't to to reduce fertility so you can have more sex. The intent is, is to save someone's life or for medical treatment. You know, that said, sometimes people make the heroic and courageous decisions not to, to use treatments like that, and now I'm talking really in the, the abortion context, um, to, to save the life of the baby. You know, and we have saints um, who, who made that choice, that they knew their own life would be lost if they continued with the pregnancy without having a necessary medical intervention and yet they did that for the life of, of their baby and and we recognize them as saints for being such so uh, does that answer the question okay So for those who couldn't hear that, the question is, how do you deal with the political sphere, especially now that you're of voting age, where if you want to follow the church's teachings on con uh, protecting life from conception to a natural death, and we have two political parties, one that protects unborn life but um, endorses the death penalty, and the other which opposes the death penalty but endorses abortion. Um, and, and that's difficult. And so what the church urges us to do is to form our consciences in church teaching, um, and, and that includes understanding the church's teachings on the death penalty and on abortion. And, and you're absolutely right that the church is not a fan of the death penalty. And particularly Pope Francis has, has made it clear that basically the, the death penalty is never permissible. And, and we could have a nice long conversation about you know, why, why that's a, a beautiful teaching, um, that we should respect life at all stages. Um, but the, the U.S. Catholic bishops, the USCCB, did put out a document, and I don't know how long ago this was, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, um, to help guide Catholics as they think about this question in elections. And they said that in thinking through all these problems, you have to weigh the pros and cons of different candidates. But when it comes to life issues, abortion is the preeminent issue over anything else, over environmentalism, over racism, over the death penalty, over immigration, over taking care of the poor, all those things. Ideally, we want a government that is filled with senators and representatives who would endorse all those things, you know, who would follow all of the church's social teachings. But what makes abortion such an intrinsic evil is that the unborn are the most innocent and helpless members of society. They're the ones that most need protection. And that, that doesn't mean that the person on death row shouldn't have a right to life. They should. But if you think about the moral culpability of someone losing their life because they killed six people versus the, the moral culpability of taking the life of an unborn human child who has never done anything wrong, that there's really no comparison between those two. Um, so it, it's a difficult question. You all need to, to study candidates and study the church's teachings and then using your conscience reach your own informed decision. But I think that USCCB document is at least a helpful way to think about it. And, and that's why it's so sad that the Democratic Party in the United States today has basically driven out all pro-life from the abortion perspective um, candidates. Uh, that you know, if you had someone in Congress who was both Democrat and pro-choice, then they would run someone against the primary to make, I'm sorry, pro-life, run a, a pro-choice candidate in the primary to get them out. Um, you know, and so it becomes very difficult to, to make that decision because one side of the political spectrum is always in favor of taking innocent life. And, and as you know, um, just from all the, the political advocacy post Dobbs, um, that it's not just taking unborn life at at, you know, a week or at six weeks, it's all the way through nine months of pregnancy. It, it's barbaric. Um, and, and so it, until voters start to tell both parties that we want you to align with our values, we're going to continue to struggle. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, regarding marriage and uh, divorce, the thing I've noticed, um, especially with divorce, obviously it's 50-50 um, in the nation and it is. Um, I've seen some statistics where a 
at least nationwide, 70% of the courses are initiated by women. And then I think college educated women is even higher. And obviously the laws in this country, the family laws and the divorce courts are heavily favored towards you know, like women dating <coughs> and things like that. So what, what would your suggestion be to like men who might see that, see this, and these statistics of how marriage doesn't seem very beneficial just from a Right. Now, now you're talking kind of social. Yeah, it's a social, you know, thing. You know, not all Catholic men are as serious as some of us might be about marriage. So what, you know, what kind of culture change do there need to be? You know, these are you know, things that are kind of, I think, very serious. Because, again, So, so for everybody's benefit, the question is, given the high divorce rates, um, the fact that, that women, college-educated women in particular, um, initiate divorces at higher rates, you know, what incentive do young men have to get married? With the caveat that this young man still wants to get married because he believes in what the Catholic Church teaches. That, that's important. We, we need to have that on record. Um, uh, and, and what you need to explain to people, wholly apart from the Catholic Church's teachings, that every economic uh, uh, professional and psychologist agrees that there is nothing better for economic prosperity and human happiness than marriage across the board. Um, that, and, and not only that, but that you are more prosperous and more emotionally satisfied the younger that you get married. You know, so all this idea about waiting until you're 38 after you've established your career, that's a recipe for being less happy. Um, so my, my great encouragement to all of you would be to, if, if God is calling you to a marriage vocation, which is the obvious first question, you need to be thinking about that. But, but if he is, you know, to, to take seriously the idea that dating is always looking for a marriage partner. And if it's obvious after the, the first couple weeks or couple months that that's not the right person, you know, then, then you respectfully break off that relationship and, and you continue to search because it, it's good for human flourishing. Now, you know, avoiding the divorce problem is difficult because every person, when they, they get married, thinks that they'll stay married forever. That's why they make those, those promises. Um, you know, if you go on your first date and she says, by the way, if we ever get married, I want a prenup, now, that's a pretty good sign in advance that there could be rough waters there. You know, but, but usually you're not going to get those kind of warning signals. So, so what are the kinds of things that you can do to make sure that you're not in that 50%? Um, well, number one is to find a, a marriage partner who shares your faith. Um, in addition to finances and marital infidelity, um, a difference in faith beliefs and faith traditions is one of the biggest sources of tension between married couples. Um, and it's unfortunate that it's, it's that way, but it, it makes sense that it is. Um, if you come to marriage and you hold all these teachings on human sexuality and you have a partner who doesn't and thinks that it's okay to have sex outside of marriage, that's going to be a pretty significant obstacle. Or you have a partner who's an atheist or agnostic and doesn't have a faith at all and doesn't come to mass with you. That's a huge obstacle. You know? So those are the kinds of things that, that you should be looking for. Um, in addition, you want someone who takes the church's teachings seriously. Because if, if you have a marriage partner who fully endorses humana vitae, endorses the theology of the body, um, endorses everything else that the, the church teaches, they will also endorse this concept that marriage is a self-giving love. That it's all about doing everything that I can to help the other person flourish to the extent possible. And those are the kinds of marriages that will be built to last. You know, and, and so that's why I find it so encouraging that those Catholic couples who go to Mass, pray together, and, and use NFP have the 99% success rate. I mean, that's absolutely remarkable. And so no matter who you marry, there's no guarantees. You know, it, it's a big step. Um, but, but knowing how much goodness and, and flourishing comes from it and finding a partner who wants to approach the marriage sacrament the same way that you do will go a long way towards making sure that it, it ends well. Yes. Okay, can you speak up a little? <laughs> Uh, that last part I couldn't hear. How does that work? 
Yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about the, the church's rules on, on divorce and things like that. First, I, I, I'm hoping you've all heard of the concept of an annulment. Um, people say that's a Catholic divorce, but that's not true. Uh, an annulment is simply a declaration by the church that the marriage never existed. And those are rarely given because usually the prerequisites for marriage are all there when two people come together and they, they say yes to each other in a marriage ceremony. Um, but let's say one of the, the couples comes in fraudulently. They don't really want to get married to be married. They want to do it because they're uh, an immigrant and they need to get married in order to stay in the United States. That would be a reason to invalidate a marriage. Or let's say one person is secretly harboring that they never want to have kids. You know, that, that would be something that violates uh, the, the church's beliefs on what makes a valid marriage. So those kinds of things. Um, but in the run mill of the cases, when a marriage breaks down and there's a divorce, there's not going to be an opportunity for an annulment because there was consent and full knowledge and everything else that went in from the get-go. And so you can get a civil divorce, and that says in the eyes of American law, you're no longer together. You'll now file separate tax returns. Your finances are disconnected and all those kinds of things. But under church law, if you haven't had an annulment, you're still considered to be married. And so that's a, a difficult path for divorced couples who are serious about their Catholic faith, especially one who has been abandoned by their spouse, uh, like, like we were just talking about a moment ago, um, you know, where one partner initiates a divorce and the other one doesn't want that because they're still considered married. So what are, what are the consequences of that? That means that person cannot enter into a marriage um, relationship with anybody else because that would be considered adultery. Now, there's a lot of questions about the church's teachings on the reception of the Holy Eucharist as a, a divorced person. And the, the church wants people to take the marriage teaching seriously, just like it wants it to teach, take the, the sexual teaching seriously. So if you've been civilly divorced and you're remarried, so the church now considers you to be in an adulterous relationship, then you are not supposed to be taking Holy Communion. Why is that? Well, Holy Communion gives us a lot of graces, um, you know, it helps eliminate our venial sins, but not our mortal sins. But if it's not taken in a state of grace, it can also be a punishment. Um, there, there's this um, scary painting um, from the, the Renaissance era of someone who received communion unworthily. And there's like a shot of light from heaven and a hole that's burned right through their heart. <laughs> because receiving the, the Lord when you're in a state of mortal sin, as you would be if you were in an adulterous relationship, is a violation of God. You're, you're taking God physically into your body when your body can't receive him. And, and that's a terrible sin, so we shouldn't do that. If you're civilly divorced, but you're not in another relationship, you're just living single, chastely, then you are eligible to receive the Eucharist because you haven't done anything to break your marriage vows. Um, your, your partner has left you, you haven't sought the divorce, you're not committing adultery, you know, and so then that's okay. Uh, but in the eyes of the church, unless the marriage was null from the beginning and you get an annulment, once married, always married, even if you get a civil divorce. Last question. Um, so it seems like the sexual revolution brought this whole like sweep of problems, and they, in some ways kind of came one at a time and one led to another, but now we've got divorce, abortion, contraception, pornography, and like all these different things. Um, do you see, is there like one aspect of that that we focus on and help sort of rebuild a uh, truer conception of, you know, anthropology in our culture? Do we have to, do we have to go after the whole package all at once? Do we have to be trying to fight like all the battles together equally? Is there like one place we should focus? Well, that's a really, really good, difficult question. So for everybody's benefit, um, the sexual revolution has brought all these problems, um, and, and we've talked about most of them tonight. So how do we get society moving back the other way, and do we have to tackle them all at once, or do we kind of go one at a time? So first, I want you to have hope. If you look at our culture and you see how decadent it's become and how many unhappy people there are. I mean, we live in the most prosperous country in the history of the world, not just in the world today, but in the history of the world. And we have more depressed, unhappy people than almost any culture that's ever existed. And a lot of it is because of these problems. But that doesn't mean we should lack hope because all you have to do is look at your Old Testament 
And over and over and over again, the people walked away from God's laws and they worshiped, worshiped foreign gods and they engaged in sex with slaves and other people. And, and they even had child sacrifice. I mean, that was the whole purpose of the balls, which the nation of Israel for a time adopted uh, until Elijah rained down fire on them. Um, it, it was child sacrifice, all the same problems that we are dealing with today. And yet those cultures always came back to God because like a loving father, uh, just like all your parents, he's constantly waiting there for you, calling you back, loving you no matter what choices you make, and just waiting for you to answer that love. So yeah, that's the really hopeful thing. So, so how do we tack it? Um, I, I don't know that it needs to be everything at once. And one of the, the beauties of the, the church is that we have many parts of the body. You know, and the nose doesn't have to be an ear, which doesn't have to be a knee, you know, you know all that. And so you've got some people who are talking about gender ideology. You've got some people talking about same-sex marriage. You've got some people talking about abortion. You've got some people talking about um, fidelity within marriage and, and the, the loose sexual relationships that we have. We have people talking about pornography. And it doesn't all have to be at the same time. I think sometimes when there are certain threats, though, we have to focus a lot of energy on those. So for example, one of the, the cutting edge problems right now is gender ideology. This whole notion that we reject the church's teachings, that we are an embodied soul, made intentionally male or female, and that we can express ourselves as, as whatever we want. You know, or, or even transhumanism, which is the next step after gender ideology. Those are such a rejection of human anthropology that we need to nip those in the bud as quickly as we can and pull back. Because if we've lost any sense as a culture of who the human person is, how can you even begin to talk about marriage and sex and, and things like that? I mean, you have to, to focus on that. Um, and, and I think abortion is another one because the consequences there are not just failed relationships and broken individuals. It's babies who are losing their lives. Um, you know, and that's why it's been so wonderful to watch the pro-life response to Dobbs. You know, in, in courthouses and capitals all across the country, you see people gathering together to try to promote a culture of life. Um, so, you know, I think in the short term, those are like the two points of emphasis, gender ideology and abortion. Uh, you know, but in, in the long haul, it goes back to the evangelization that I would like all of you to do, which is to help people understand this anthropology of the human person. Um, it's going to be your job to talk about it. Um, because if, if, if young people aren't spreading this news, um, not many people are going to hear about it. And, and it's a shame that we don't hear about it from the pulpit more often. I mean, how many of you um, in the last five years have heard a homily at church about sex and marriage? Two, three, four, five, six. All right. That's not very many out of a group this big. And that, that's probably more. I mean, maybe you guys have some particularly good churches. I, I, I've been to many churches and rarely hear homilies on that subject. Um, so it, it's up to us as the lay church, as, as the body, to be spreading that message and, and to be doing it with enthusiasm and, um, and joy and helping people understand the joy that they will receive if they fall in line with what God has asked us to do. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Have a good night. <laughs>